So first of all, I want to say thank you very much for coming on. It's long overdue. You're one of those um, pillars of the community that um, everyone looks up to and has been a, a mentor and a, and a role model for a lot of guys like my age, for sure, and, and I'm sure guys older and younger than me. Uh, you've had a stellar career in your own right, but then also you've been instrumental in other guys' progressing and, and excelling. So I just want to say thanks a lot for coming on and I really appreciate it. Well, thanks JD. This is uh, going to be a fun day. I hope, you know, it's always difficult to talk about y yourself, but you know, I owe thanks to, to so many people that, that, that helped me grow to who I was and get to where I got. And that's one of the things I'm going to be doing today is saying thanks. And, you know, I, I do have to put a disclaimer out there first that my memory isn't the greatest. So they're truths in my mind. They may be Right. Facts of me changed or <laughs> stuff like that, but uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, so uh, I see when you start these off, you know, people talk about their, you know, where they grew up in their hometowns. And well, I grew up in a town of 2,000 people in Whartonville, Minnesota, a long time ago. Uh, graduated high school in 1982. Uh, and back then, you know, times were different, you know especially up there because there was nothing to do. So like on a Friday night or whatever, we'd go, you know, doing road trips. That's just the way it was, you know. Uh, but uh, I, I chose the military because for a couple of reasons, uh, you know, I was a CD student, you know, I was into sports and, and didn't do a, do a lot of education stuff and then uh, didn't know where to go. I mean, it's just like I could stay in the hometown, work at the cheese factory next door or 7-Up Body Club, and that wasn't, wasn't what, what I was going to go. And my friends were, they were all going to school and stuff like that. So, I was, you know, I had some friends that had applied to go to the military and I talked to one of them. He went in the army and uh, I wasn't going to do that. You know, so I went in the air force, uh, tried to figure out what to do. There was nothing, you know, for me to pick. So like a lot of your people on your show, you know, have talked about coming in open general and. So I came to service open general in August 82 and then got down to basic and basic is basic, you know, um, right. Well, it was a basic, you know, trying to figure out what to do. I don't know if I had a pamphlet on PJ and I know, I know that you'd see him everywhere or saw him everywhere or anything like that. But I said, I talked to the recruiter. I said, Hey, I want to do something exciting. My brother was a deep sea diver is the guy that I sent in the picture, you know, he used bell saturation diver and, uh, I know he'd gone to at least 550 feet below the ocean, but he got paid really well. But the problem is he'd be a deep sea diver, a bell saturation diver. It's a very dangerous uh, occupation and he paid the price. Uh, he got brought up too fast one time and it started off slowly with decompression sickness with the bends and then he had, had other problems and then he died at age of 26 of what, what they said natural causes. It's, it's fine. I mean, it, it, you know, he, he drove me to, to a little bit where, where I am. So, uh, but yeah, he, he, he passed at an early age and, you know, um, the Lackland recruiter gave me some, when I graduated basic training, I had some sheet that said, Hey, you know, something, something, Harborfield, Florida, jump, possibly jump, you know? And so I went to, uh, Harborfield, Florida and the TACP schoolhouse. No clue about the military either. No clue about what TACP did. And, and I think it, any, anybody at that time, most people didn't know what TACP was, you know. Um, right. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think you could come in guaranteed at the time. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of the same way when I, I, I actually, by the time I got to be able to uh, join the military, they gave it to me guaranteed. Like the guy, the recruiter was like, hey, there's a, a job where you can ride around in a Jeep and carry a rifle. I'm like, yeah, okay, sounds good. And I just got in. But yeah, I think before that, it was more of a, kind of luck of the draw kind of thing wasn't it yeah luck of the draw if you, if you want to call it a good draw but yeah i mean i i i, I definitely can't complain because it gave me a lot of opportunities and one thing i've always said in the military i was truly blessed uh for where i got to go what i got to do who i got to meet who i got to see things i got to do you know um it, and i don't know how i got so lucky you know but the schoolhouse i was trying to remember you know what i remembered about the schoolhouse and truth i could i could couldn't tell you how the I knew Wally Kuha was an instructor there. I don't know why that just popped up in my head now because I couldn't think of any names earlier. Um, but yeah. trying to think of the instructors that were there, um, don't remember. Um, but I do remember, you know, there was a air, airborne PT program. Uh, myself and I don't know how many others, maybe four or five, volunteered to be part of it. And then if you in those days there was no 
strict curriculum on what you could do for PT and how, how bad you could beat people down. And so we did normal PT and then we'd do after that, the airborne PT would, would be past that. And then, you know, that's just like where the, the instructor's looking like you're, they're wolves and you're little lambs, you know, they're just, just beating you, <laughs> beating you down. And we did a lot of PT and it ended up, I think we only had two slots and me and a cross training, I think his, well, I know his name is Gary Broussard went to, went to airborne school. We got the only two slots. Well, one person that I met there too is, you know, it was kind of funny is Russ Carpenter, you know, he was there, he was, he was a big runner at the time and jumping ahead. I, I didn't see him for another 18 years after, after tech school because he was on the non airborne side of the house. And you oh, know, right. for a long time, there was, you either airborne or you, you, you weren't. I got stuck on the East Coast for most of my time. But anyway, the the PT at the at the schoolhouse was was definitely pretty challenging. Uh, prepared you for the hurry up and wait at airborne school. But the only other thing I remember about tech school would be you know we had this old well they tried to teach us teletype. We had the old, I think somebody on your talk the old need teletype thing, but we just did a couple little things with that. And then we had the Pick Forty Seven, which is this huge radio, and you had to turn the knobs to, to fine tune it. And if you took too long, you're burning your hands. And <laughs> glad, glad we got rid of that. That's about what I remember on tech school. I don't know if you got any fond memories, you know. Actually, it was kind of fun because, uh, and I think you probably experienced this with the airborne program. I also did the same thing. And uh, I was just talking to a buddy of mine, Sundance Scardino. He and I went to tech school together. And it was me and him and, uh, and someone, De Saavedra. And you, you probably experienced this too. But you, when you did the extra PT, it was almost like you were fight, not fighting, but like competing against that other guy to kind of yeah. do better. You know, you're like, he was running faster. So you had to run faster. And you kind of pushed each other. And it was, uh, by the time we got to jump school, it was a joke. I mean, I don't know how it was for you, but it was the PT was nothing. And we were in such great shape after being, uh, like you said, kind of almost abused during tech school for yeah. the animal program yeah uh, it was a, it was a it was a breeze yeah i guess you know they went with the model of the strong shell stand you know versus the what they're doing now i think and i don't really know what they're doing now but there, there's, there's a methodical approach to how they're gradually getting people better and f faster stronger and, and all that right but, you know beat downs do work to get you you know stronger too so <laughs> for sure that's the old method that we went but uh, that's pretty much tech school. I leave tech school, go to airborne school with Gary Broussard. But luckily me, you know, he was a staff sergeant. I was an airman basic. So I get there and I get zero week. What zero week was is that I had to do guard mount and walk around the airborne towers with an axe handle. And, you know, just and I'm like, what am I doing here? All right. I did sneak my stripe on early though. Nobody... They didn't know that, but because I didn't want to sew it on when I was in there, so I put it on a few days early. But yeah, you know, airborne school was okay. I mean, it's a, I remember cardiac hill, you know, you like, it's not that bad, you know. The airborne shuffles, well, I think it was an eight or nine minute pace, you know. All right. Um, the PT test is probably the hardest one because that's where they, the hardest thing that they could do to you because that's where they could go keep saying zero, zero, zero. If they didn't right, like right. you, they, they won't, won't get you in. But other than that, airborne school wasn't that hard. What year did you go? Uh, 91. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to think. You know, when, when we were there, the only way to pass an inspection was if you went to Mr. Boot Black. You know, and, and, you know, you oh put yeah, this, yeah, yeah, this garbage on your boots, just tear them up. You know, but you pass that inspection. You know, but right. So jump school is like I think it was three weeks long. Uh, I did not get the opportunity because of high winds to do the 250 foot towers, which actually could have been kind of fun. I, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know if you got to or not. We did. We we actually got yeah because it was the same way with us. It was it was looking like we weren't going to be able to because the prior classes had the winds were too high. But yeah, we actually got to do it. I got I think I did it one time, and it was okay. it was it was kind of eye opening as far as like okay, this is what it's going to be like to kind of you know descend and then hit the ground and kind of do an actual PLF. But it was pretty fun. Oh, cool. Um, and then the only other thing I got about an air bunch school is like get you all rigged up and you're standing on the the tarmac waiting to go. So we had some somebody who was ultra nervous and could not hold their bladder and just basically pissed himself, you know, right there. And you can just hear it. <laughs> you can just hear it just going, going, you know, coming out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, after five successful jumps, at least five, five jumps that I didn't get hurt, you know, I go to Shaw Air Force Base and Shaw was pretty, pretty cool at the time, you know, cause they had a task and the task would support, provide bodies, you know, the battalion ALOs and one, or two seven five, so one one Charlie fours to go with them to like brag the or the divisions that are out there that that were under now the 18th ASOG. 
Um, but, you know, we had a bunch of lieutenants. We had O2 Skymaster airplane that was basically a little prop job and had a pallet in the back. So, you know, oh, really? a comp pallet back. Yeah. Cool. And then, so you, you got, I got a, probably a couple opportunities to, to go up and air fact, you know, as, as an airman, you know, I probably wasn't talking on the radio, um, but just to get that air perspective, it's because, you know, as a ground guy, it's a whole different view when you're looking horizontally to, to, to get the exposure to going vertically looking down. And that's why it's kind of nice when, you know, you can get fan flights, you know, for, for guys. And it's, it's, it's actually should be part of the curriculum just to get a different perspective viewpoint of like when you say, see the bridge or you see the hill. Well, there's seven hills or eight hills that this guy's seen. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> right. Anyway, got a couple of rides on those. And then uh, they also had CH3 helicopters there. And what was nice about that is when I first got there, the first day that, that we had our first jump up, I got to get four jumps out of the CH3 helicopters. I was able to get, I think when the, the first year I had 50 jumps, you know, uh, at, while I was at Shaw. The other thing that was cool about that is, you know, we had Jeeps and trailers, whether it was a 107 or 108 pallet, it didn't, it didn't really matter, you know. But we would back those things up into the CH3 and then you just have inches, you know, space, but, you know, just as a way to move the Jeep to get somewhere. We never went anywhere, you know, with the Jeep inside it, you know, but we, yeah. that was one of our skill sets we had to practice. Uh, then I, well, while I was at Shaw, there was the skinny, wiry, snot nosed kid. I, I like, I'll call Ray J because I got to give him a hard time first. But anyway, Ray J was a, not skinny or snot nose or anything like that, but he's, he's a good friend of mine. Taught me a lot while I was there, you know, because I was probably a kid that needed direction and he provided the direction and, and the focus and stuff. Um, but one day there's probably, you know, you know, you're, you're at the, you got a squadron and they say, Hey, we need somebody to do a static display or somebody to do a task and something like that. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's a pain in the butt for whoever's got to manage it or, you know, like you get the task to, you know, find somebody to do it you know well ray j tricked me you know he goes hey you want to find a way to meet meet women i said sure <laughs> he said he said you know i ended up being doing the static display <laughs> which is pretty cool because at the time you know the air force was in the green pickle suit and we were in camouflage right. you know the old the old camis and uh so i got on there i don't know me and somebody we set it up we got the camouflage net out we got everything got the radios out we're camouflaged up we got a beret not not camo face but camo uniform with a beret yeah. on looking all hot to trot or whatever good guess you know but at the Sumter mall and then uh all of a sudden here comes this skinny brunette with tight jeans and gray t-shirt on i remember it because she had like arm sweat through here you know i give her i think i got them going too <laughs> but <laughs> you know we hit it off and then uh come february We'll be married 40 years and it's all, oh, you congrats. know, thanks to Ray. Yeah. Thanks to Ray J and that, that task that he had me do, you know, but yeah, he's, he, he's a good dude, you know, he believed in me and believed in my capabilities, you know, and, and then one of the things that was different in 83, you know, uh, the Marine branch got blown up, I think on 23 October or something like that. Oh, right. And then, uh, so we got alerted at Shaw and she was, I know was my girlfriend, uh, at the time. They couldn't tell her where I went, you know, what was going on, but, uh, myself and I know Kenny Watterson went, I don't know who all else went from Shaw. We went up to, from Shaw up to Fort Bragg and we get a brief at the old debt one five oh seventh or 14th ASOS saying, Hey, we're going to Grenada. And everybody's like, where is, Gren you know, where is this Isle of Spice? You know, uh, right. didn't really, didn't know where we we're going, you know, we end up going to, to, to Grenada. The Ranger did jump in. I, I know that Master Sergeant Scott from uh, first bat jumped in. I think you had, you had, uh, Staha. I, I think he said, I think he jumped. And then we had a guy from Shaw jump in from Texas Army Lance Heaton at the time, jump in with, with the Rangers and stuff. Okay. Um, we are, we all, everybody, everybody else, all air landed. And the big jump in at the, to, for the Rangers was, was good. Bad for the 82nd because, well, 82nd took flat because later on, you're like, why are we paying all these thousands of people to, to be on airborne status if they're not, they're not jumping in? So later on, you'll see in Panama, they were jumping, you know, hours, you know, a day later, you know, into, into, into Panama because that's what they do, even though everything's secured. 
right, right. But so I left Shaw and, and I get up to the brag, you know, we, we go in theater and then I realize that, you know, um, those guys suspended everything that I had in my vehicle. It was just like super tied down. It's like, you know, cause I was stuck out processing through Shaw because Shaw had to process people and we had, you know, no orders, you know, stuff like that trying to get out, you know, it was a little bit of a gaggle, but Grenada was Grenada. I think it was a, I'm pretty sure it was a one striper, but I had a Lieutenant Bruce. I don't know why I remember his name, but you know, he was a, he was a, actually a pretty good, uh, Lieutenant. Um, and then, uh, I also got to meet my first angle code team while I was there, which is, you know, when you're used to being just you and a lieutenant and you see an angle code team and then they got like 12 or 13 dudes, you know, supporting, trying to do the same stuff. And it's like, Jesus, so many people, you know, right. But, uh, and while I was there uh, in, in Grenada, the other thing it was like, I remember the, that one guy's had a, you know, the, uh, cardboard from a MRE box and had everybody's call signs and where the where units were supporting. I think that's still in the 14th day house, which, which is kind of neat little, little piece of history that, you know, yeah. that, that they had. Um, uh, but other than that, you know, not much going on with the time I got there. I mean, there was a little bit, but it was, it was only a couple day thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I was getting ready to leave, I learned a valuable lesson, you know, um, I was on the back of the runway at Point Salinas, you know, it was a C5 getting ready to take off. And, you know, I thought it was a pretty big air, airfield, you know, but uh, one of the things that ended up happening, I don't know if he took that as a challenge or, you know, with people sitting at the back end of the the, the runway, but this guy thought he was on a 5,000 foot runway with a C5 trying to take off because he just par break the, the departure takeoff. And then it's just like, all of a sudden I'm getting sandblasted. The sh- the, there's a porter john behind me, just a little bit. They get tipped over, and you know, I don't know if there was anybody in there, but you know, but it's just, oh it's just like it's just a free way to sand somebody, you know. Yeah. But jeez. Uh, <laughs> after after Grenada, I ended up going back to to Shaw, um, and then somehow we got uh, like four Ranger slots, and you know, and. You know, when you're in tech school, they, they teach you, you know, I want to be an airborne ranger, this, you know, all these little hula songs and stuff like that, you know. Somehow, you know, we get we get some slots, and uh, I did look this up. I knew Johnny Vallejo was the first one to go. He was at Shaw with me. And then Greg Mosley, Dan the Man Hennigan. Did you ever meet him? Probably. Uh, I think on occasion, yeah, not too many times, but I think we did cross paths once or twice. Okay, and then I got mine, you know, but we all went in 83. 384 because it was all class year 84 okay. grad um but before since i got the the ranger school slot i said well they repel so you know i need to get smarter repellent so i got to go to aerosol school you know nice. which was not too bad at fort campbell and then i, I pcs early to, to to brag to go to ranger school um i didn't go straight to ranger school i went to the first bat pre-ranger uh, which was which was nice because I, I don't remember how long it was, uh, but they taught you everything you needed to know to go to ranger school. You know, I had navigated and stuff. It's like you know, I knew comms, you know, but there was other things that they they taught you, you know, because when you're in ranger school, you're actually going to take a a pine needle. They say where you at, you got to take a pine needle, put it on a map where you're at, you know. So it's going to be very very good navs. But I think uh, I'm there for three weeks and then. We, we go to ranger school there's probably 15 to 20 of us that go which is which is really nice because no matter what platoon you're in you there's at least a couple rangers that you know you know so yeah some friendly familiarity. faces yeah yeah some people so which is very helpful so one of the things i know is that ranger school you know you, you first get there and i don't know if i i, I could have swore this might have been one of my black head instructors or just the familiarity of that he was a black hat, but he went to ranger school and these ranger school instructors remembered this guy named Sergeant Snappy because he was a Filipino or whatever. Yeah. And they just, and it was like when they saw him coming in and he was going to the ranger school, they were just like, he was getting got a lot of love, you know, just for, you know, airborne instructor, you know, they got a little, they got a little payback. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I go to, you know, you get the bending phase and I, I guess I was stressed out during the, the bending phase because I thought they were going to, you know, 
tear up our lockers, you know, to, you know, ransack our, our place and tell them every night I'm waiting for it and they won. They didn't do it. So I lost my sleep, you know, self-induced loss sleep prepping for it, you know, waiting for yeah. it. And, um, but, uh, so you go to, for, leave Benny and you go to mountain phase and, you know, everybody, everybody's fondest memories about mountain phase is the blueberry pancakes. Um, but before I get to the pancakes, I guess we could talk about, you know, it's like mountain phase is a, a good place to work your legs, you know, cause you, you, there's some decent climbing and then you find out that, it, and there's so many trees that were down that, you know, you're like having to step out trees, you know, just want to make sure you didn't jack anything up, you know, but yeah, yeah. blueberry pancakes that, you know, I, I, I really like to go back there and, and try the blueberry pancakes. And the reason why is because, you know, one of the things that Ranger School does is they don't give you food and they don't give you sleep. Right. You know, how good are those blueberry pancakes when you're not <laughs> starving, you know? Yeah. But when you're starving, you know, that's all you're thinking about, you know? Uh, uh, another memory I had is when, once we get done with that, each phase, you know, and I was a 60 gunner during one of the last phase before we got done with the, the mountain phase. And, you know, you get an inspection, you know, we, me and my assistant gunner, we didn't clean the M60 good enough. And there was a lot of other people that didn't do stuff good enough, you know, so, but they, they let us have the Hua meal. Uh, but after the Hua meal, you know, the Hua meal is basically where you don't get a lot of food and then you get, you get a nice dinner, you know, for congratulations, you know? Okay. Well, once we, once we are, you know, you know, bellies are full, all of us that failed the, in, the inspections and stuff had to go down to this, just, I don't know if it was an airfield, but it was like an airfield, you know, I think it was just a big open field. And then we played grass drills, ups and downs, eight count body builds, just that, you know, uh, but what was fun, you know, what's cool about it is, you know, after a point when you're getting smoked, it's like, you can't smoke me. People were starting to join it. We were laughing, you know, because it became actually kind of hua, you know, a beat down that flipped, flipped it, you know, a good memory, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, when I went to Ranger School, we went to the Bliss for the desert phase and Bliss totally sucked. Because um, <laughs> when we get there, for five days, it's basically spitting on us, you know, raining, you know, on and off for five days. And then with the soil that you're there and you, you know, you're doing long distances, you know, which can be deceiving. It's like, you see a light, you know, you think in the desert, you know, that could be 20 miles away when you see that light, you know, but you know, everything was just all over your hands, your clothes. And, you know, the good thing about ranger school, you know, you have this wet weather gear, but you know, it's going to be in your rock. You're not going to wear it, you know? Right. <laughs> And, you know, the shoes, I remember, you know, my size 11s or 12s, whatever, they were probably 15 or 16s with the, you know, because the mud just gets on it so, so, oh, so, right. so much, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> we get out of, we get out of desert phase, you know, again, with a bunch of rain, we get to Herbertville, Florida, you know, or Eglin, starts to rain on us, you're going, oh, this is not bad, you know? It's, it's 70 degrees, you know? Um, yeah. But, uh, Ended up being that it rained a lot there too. And then on our final mission, you got to go to this, this boat operation to that's in San Clemente, not San Clemente, uh, in the sound of, outside her. Oh, Santa Rosa. Yeah. So you, we, we end up loading these, been raining all day, do the, get, load the LCMH, which is a, landing craft carrier like the front comes down you know you see like storming the beaches of normandy type boat you know we got our zodiacs on there and it was just cold and i don't know what happened but somebody must have got hyperthermia or something you know while we we're there because all of a sudden we stop outside herbert field florida it's probably around midnight or whatever they get us off the off the lcm eights and they just start marching us you know we try to get the blood flowing to get us warm you know okay and all i'm thinking is you know the DFAC is open right now. <laughs> we could go to the DFAC, you know, but couldn't do it. But ended up finishing that in, in Ranger School. But one thing I did want to highlight, you know, is it was like a, a, a success, you know, it was, you know, because I think I went in there like 180, 185, and got like, got down to 140, 145 or something like that. Lost a lot of, lot of weight. Wow. Um, but, you know, Cause that time I think the, the goal was, I think they'd give you like one meal a day when you're out in the, the, the field, you know, but you're expending a lot of energy, but sure. I was so happy 
when one day I'm on one side of patrol base and somebody on the other side of patrol base tries to sneak some peanut butter, you know, and I go, you know, animalistic instinct, you know, I can smell that peanut butter, yeah, uh, all the way over. Um, but that was pretty cool. Um, but once I get done with range, ranger school, I go back to Bragg and, uh, I did want to talk about some of the cool guys over there. It was Mass Sergeant Joe Walks. He was a staple of Fort Bragg. Uh, he'd been there for a long time. Chief Fiscus, he was there, which was kind of funny. Both these guys passed in the last couple of years, but Chief Fiscus was, he must have been like buck five or something like that. Because we would do jumps and it's like, he'd be like, the could be the first person out. Everybody else has already landed and he's still like, you know, 300 feet in the air, you know. He was a good dude, you know. And then some of the, the great people that we had there were, like Mitch Monroe, uh, he gave me a task of valor or something like that. I didn't do so well, so I remember him. But he changed from enlisted to an officer. And then we had Matt Hoos, who also went to become an officer. And both those guys made colonel. Okay. William D. MacArthur was there when I was there. Uh, ended up doing a, a few few deployments with him. Uh, Jazz was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, the fond memory I have of Jazz there and, uh, and Again, I don't know the exact details, but he was taking pictures at something, you know, on a jump. And I think he was by the door. I know he had to be by the door. Lost his camera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> camera got a set of wings that day. Um, but some of the other greats that were there, you know, you know, we weren't great at the time. We were just young. But like Eddie Morales, Kenny Lindsay, Dwayne Fisher, who was a, who it was a, ended up being a PJ. Mike Benicki. Uh, it was funny. Funny about Mike is. He was, he was very, very good friend at the time. He's still a good, good friend, but somehow uh, he stayed over one night. He came in two, and the next thing I know, he's, he's living with us for a little bit, you know, but <laughs> right. got me a dog and stuff like that. But he was actually there to when my wife said she was pregnant with my daughter when she was, started going to labor that took care of my son and, and stuff like that. So oh, wow. um, we did have some good ALOs, in the, you know, but I want to talk about the ALO quality in a, in a sec, but we had a Captain Montgomery and a Colonel Terry Bittner. Captain Montgomery was just a go getter. I mean, he was, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure he went to work with the Rangers and stuff like that, you know, on and off, you know, at, from, from Bragg, but really good guy. Terry Bittner for the old, older guys that were at that one know that he was a really good dude, but, uh, just want to make sure I talk about those two. Sure. And then, uh, you know Don Beckman, Don Beckman and Tommy King. Have you heard of their names? For sure. Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, well, Don at the time and, and Tommy, uh, I think we're, at, when I was there the first time, were both admin troops. And then Don, I think, ended up going to to Vincenza, and Tommy King ended up going to the twenty second Ace off. Uh, one of the, I think, might have been one of the first guys over there, uh, but he ended up going there for a little bit. But when I look at the Alos of the eighties to the Alos of today, it's in, I don't want to sound negative, but it's almost like we got the run to the litter, litter versus the pick of the litter. Hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is that, uh, there were, again, there were a couple of good Alos, but it's almost like a prison exchange. You know, it's Alos had gotten in trouble or officers had gotten in trouble. They came right. into the Alo career field so they could, go back to flying, you know, pay their, pay their dues, you know, cause it wasn't a very glamorous job, you know? So, you know, it's like, if, if you get an order to the Pentagon, you'd go do it, you know, you're not happy about it, but you know, anyway. I think, I think you're, that's a good point. I mean, I, like a lot of, a lot of the ALOs, no hit on them, you know, not trying to disparage them at all, but that was more of a, nobody really wanted to do that gig. Like nobody was, uh, was excited to be an ALO cause they wanted to fly. They were pilots and they wouldn't do that. Now to your point, now we have some some alos that are not they either uh, are never going to fly again or career alos like that's the they, the whole yeah. point of they wanted to come in to be an alo which is phenomenal because that's I think that's what the career field was missing was a was a constant um, kind of a, that cohesion where you know because the CCT guys they always had like officers that are you know they have, now they have stows and they have a lot of people to advocate for them so not to say like, again I don't want to say that we didn't have good alos like you said we had a heck of a lot of good alos a lot of good commanders. Um, yeah, there was a combat control squadron right outside our door, you know, at, at the 14th and, you know, with, with their career officers, you know, without having the, the temp hires, you know, you, 
you could visually see at one point we were, we were here and then I think ended up they, you know, they progressed, you know, oh, for sure. a little bit better, a little bit faster. Cause they ended up having more, you know, better, you know, better training schools, you know, better preparation, you know, and stuff like that, where we were struggling, where, you know, you could be a staff sergeant and you may not be a good instructor, but you're going to be teaching your three airmen or whatever. And, you know, so the quality could, would be dependent on the supervisor and stuff like that. Right. But the big thing, you know, you know, and you can, you can tell it was different because I don't think anybody made those six from us, from a squad or on a, you know, the, in the early eighties and, you know, maybe even in the early nineties, it wasn't until general Angoria and nine 11 kicked off that we started getting, you know, cause the people are doing great things and it, the tech community gets highlighted and, you know, uh, but, but I'll talk on, you know, general Angoria later. And the other thing I liked about Bragg is, you know, and this is a pre JTAC thing, um, is that, we were field experts, you know, we did land navigation, we, we map and compass. I think we were good at the, the basics, you know, we may not have been JTACs, you know, which in a way sometimes depends on where you were, could be a detriment because you had paint nipple on the other day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was talking about drum, you know, they had cast four days a week, you know, right. where at the 14th, you know, you may not have, you didn't have that opportunity. So you're always traveling, trying to get cast, you know, so you, you, you're spending all this time, all this energy, non-productively trying to get something, you know, mm-hmm. or out in the range, you know, for, you know, to get one control or something like that, or, <laughs> right. you know, that's where we lost a little bit of the focus on being experts at the field stuff, because we were so focused on the JTAC stuff, which is, and, and again, I can't say it's wrong. It would just been nicer if we could have had more opportunities to do cast and, more opportunities to, to do the basic stuff, you know, because right. it kind of got to me out of ba- out of balance. But so uh, some of the key memories I have out of, out of Fort Bragg is uh, don't fire pan or slap flares up on a, on an airfield. <laughs> so what what I get out of that is uh, we were doing some training, you know, because that's what we did at, at the 14th, you know. Yeah. And we were doing some movements and stuff. And we're like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. We're passing flares, this, that, and the other. And then, well, our training became an E&E event from the cops because uh, <laughs> all of a sudden, because command posts would call the cops. I saw the flares, this, that, and the other. And, and so, so and it was a decent-sized piece of woods, you know. So we were doing this training. All of a sudden, seeing lights everywhere. And then so we ended up having to do a E&E back that was kind of funny. That We never got caught. They may have known it was us, but. But, you know, we're back in the squad and just laughing at, you know, it's like uh, on that. So uh, the other thing that kicked off that I remember was Operation Golden Pheasant kicked off. And, and there's something probably I mean, nobody knows about. I mean, it's, 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 uh, we were supposed to go to the San Anisans came into Honduras and, and stuff like that. So we ended up jumping into Honduras and it ended up being more from a, Training, even though it's an operation, they were talking about possibly inv- us, you know, invading, but it ended up changing to a training operation. But okay. me and Buddy McCarthy went on that one and uh, ended up being there for I think two weeks or something like that. But it wasn't; it was it was really benign. Oh, okay. Uh, um, and then uh, the other thing I remember about Bragg is. Uh, and it was not really bragging, it made more thought at the time. There was a big, there was a big uh, divide between airborne and non-airborne, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, if you ain't airborne, you ain't, you know, like, you know, the, the thing was, you know, right, right. but uh, throughout my career and probably yours too, you, you, you realize that there's great people in, in either, either venue. Uh, For sure. You know, 100%. but what I think, I think that what, Airborne does for people, although it's just a school, you know, you could be an A1C, but you're in a level of responsibility that you're not getting, a, I think, in the, in the armor side. And I'm, I'm speaking not knowing, but I, I, the reason why I say that is because as an A1C you could, or a senior airman, you could be a jump master and stuff like that. So when you're a jump master, you're in charge. You know, it doesn't matter if Chief Alola's on the airplane, you know, Kona, whoever, you know. Right. If I'm the jump master, you know, 
I'm in charge, you know, or you're in charge, you know, they're in charge. Mm -hmm. So that level of responsibility and planning that they got to do, because they got to plan the jump, they got to, you know, how we're getting back, you know, all this stuff. So I think that was a good learning opportunity for those guys to, uh, to at an early age, you know, and now, sure. now probably not so much of a, a big deal because everybody's coming out, f I think, fully qualified as JTAX, you know, at least that's what I'm, I'm hearing that that's supposed to be going on. But, um, so I was at Bragg from 84 to 89 and then I leave Bragg to go to the 89 to 93. I go to the third, third 75th Ranger Regiment. And the process, you know, the whole, not only the process, but the level of people at, at, at the ranges has changed or improved. But at the time, I had to write a letter to state why I should be able to go there, this, that, and the other. And somehow, mm -hmm. at the time, I was a staff sergeant. Staff sergeant Valola got to go to go to the rangers, you know. Um, uh, so I get there. Uh, I think Jazz is there. Bruce Abrams is there. I, I don't know if Jazz I, – I think – Jazz beat me, beat me there. I, I, I could be wrong. Um, and I, don't, I have no clue, you know, because I love being at the Rangers. I remember the people there. I don't remember who was there when I, when I first got there, you know, right, like, right. I, 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 on the battalion. But it was like uh, Bruce Avance and, you know, Chris Honecky got there. And I don't know if you met him or not, but Chris was, was a really good dude. I mean, you'd say something about your family. You'd say something about him. He'd, he'd write it down and he'd, constantly come back and talk to you about your family or this, that, and the other. And then uh, Paul Ford at, at some point got there when I was there. And, and I'm not saying he was pretty, he's methodical. You know, sure. he, he, oh, yeah. I know he's, 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 he's won a competition, but he, you know, he asked me one time and he goes, all right, so I'm going to jump. When I land, what I, what would I do first? And he wanted to know point, but you know, do this, do this, you know, right. What is the, what is the you know exact process? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, waistband, you know, you you know, um, but he was pretty cool. Paul was there when I first got there in '97, so he must have been. That was that overlap, you know, between the two of us. But yeah, I, you had left already. I think um, I'm not. When did you leave, uh, Benning? '93. '93. Okay, yeah. yeah. So Paul was there for a long time then, but yeah, he, he, I, that's the thing I remember about Paul is just very methodical, very meticulous. You know, he was very, um, uh, and as far as like just the job in general, he knew, you know, he knew everything. It was, it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think Paul probably got there in 92. I think it was there like a year before I, I left. Okay. Um, and then, uh, while I was there, um, desert storm kicks off. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't go. And, but we had done a bunch of training missions, you know, where we had chemical protective undergarments. I think Marty might've talked about going somewhere with those, those on. Oh yeah. But, uh, it just, you know, they realized that, you know, the level of what they wanted us to do, the juice wasn't worth to squeeze. So, you know, although it was hard to accept, you know, everybody's going over there to, you know, to the desert, you know, we stayed back, you know, it's like, you know, a little bit of, you know, little snot bubble, you know, that we're crying about. It's That's not right. a big deal, you know. Um, but what, what did I learn about the Rangers? You know, what a, what a, what a great place to be, you know, the training opportunities that we had, you know, oh, yeah. um, I got to go to scouts from my school and we did that down in Herbert field, Florida, you know, we're doing three, four kilometers swims out in the ocean, you know, uh, at night, you know, had boat operations, we were helo cast and we were doing all this stuff and, you know, we're doing sw swimming over the bud line and, Myself and Eric Kibri were uh, the team that I was on. Were, and Eric was an Air Force guy. Um, we were the strong swimmers on the team, so we were in the front of what was the bud line. So you'd have us, you know, everybody had like their arm connected to the, a loop, and then you may know, you have six or eight people behind you, and it just kept everybody was connected to it, so that way you could f swim together, you know, without losing contact. Well, me and Eric were strong swimmers, so the bad thing about that is, is you're in front. So when the, you, you're swimming towards the shore, every time that the, the wave hits the back of the people, you're getting sucked into the wave. So you, you know, oh, yeah. we, so you're sucking, you know, you gotta be used to drinking some salt water. Oh, man. Uh, uh, and then uh, also that 
while we were, while I was at the, the Rangers, uh, Operation Just Cause kicked off. You know, we had done about some preps in, 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 in Florida, you know, rehearsals and stuff like that. I don't think we were on uh, alert at the time, but because I know Jazz talked about it. We were having a Christmas party and that's right. <laughs> uh, you know, we we get alerted. We're all together. So it was actually not too bad. We're at Steve Stangle's house, which is on Fort Benning, you know, maybe half a mile from uh, the Rangers and stuff. We get there. We go in. Uh, uh, I was with Charlie Company. The rest, so I, I ended up going to the first bat and the rest of Alpha and, and Bravo. I jumped into Rio Hato and I went to Teresa C- to Kuman with, uh, you know, first bat with Marty and Roger and stuff like that. Where, and I, and, it, and I know Roger talked about, and I think Marty may have too, but the weather was horrendous that, that time, you know, it was cold. It was rainy. You know, we, we, we were one of the guys that did, or one of the groups that did the full sustained airborne training out in the, the sleep or whatever, you know, uh, I think Roger said he took a 141. I would do the lucky card of the C-130 for an eight hour rigged up equipment flight. Oh. So for eight hours, I'm, I'm stuck in there and, and I had the same experience with like jazz did, you know, it's like, you got to use the bathroom. You got to, the container comes down the line and your, your, your ranger buddies, you know, telling you, you know, stop because of the, the, the containers getting full and stuff like that. But yeah. by the time, the, the time we got to Panama, because they averted, you know, locations, it's like, get me out of this freaking plane. You know? right. So it's all you cared about. Yeah. So I jump, I jump into Teresa to Kuman and there is a field of Kunda grass and this is like super high. And all we know, all, all I knew is that the 82nd is supposed to be jumping in and like, or, they were in heavy drop their vehicles prior to them jumping in, uh, like an hour after our, our insertion or something like that. And I'm, I'm stuck in this grass. And so I'm, I'm getting my rock, put it in front of me, laying down, getting my rock, put it in front of me, laying down. I just, oh, I gotta get off this goddamn airfield. Get me off this airfield, you know, cause it's just like they're coming, you know, and it's like, um, but anyway, I, I did get off, got off in time. 82nd was late cause they had up. They had a DI of planes and, and all that stuff, and they had their own problems, you know. Um, and that's this is where, you, again, there were some people that jumped at, I believe, jumped at night. But the next day, the next day and a half, you know, they they're, they're continue to jump, you know. Not really necessary, right. but, yeah, I got, I, got, I got it, you know. They got in trouble the last time. Um, some of my other memories that I have of – the ranger ranger bad is uh i had a company my company commander and my my first sorry my company commander was captain steve townsend who uh during one rehearsal one training exercise somebody screwed up i think it was his rto and you know a lot of times you see rangers you know are be very vocal and, and, and stuff like that but he just grabbed the guy took him off to the side gave him his ass to him brought him back into the team, um, which was to me very cool. And I met him multiple times throughout my career. You know, I met him as a Colonel, I met him as a, uh, I think he was a one star one time, but, uh, he actually, uh, facilitated me when I, uh, interviewed for, for the CENTCOM CEM position or, uh, you know, with, with General Mattis, you know, yeah, but yeah. Kem Townsend, General Townsend, you know, who became the AFRICOM commander was, very professional and i met him a few times he still remembered me too so that was that was that was always kind of nice you know but oh, yeah. you know, remember your air force jtac you know and then uh the other the other guy was uh mass first sergeant beam who became command sergeant major beam who was in charge of nato afghanistan or whatever you know mm-hmm. uh i don't know if you ever linked up with him down there down there but he's a great dude one of the times when i was the absence uh command chief you know i got a picture of him, me and him we got a go bikes and we're both flipping off uh the marty and i would send it to him you know <laughs> but he, yeah he was he was a great great dude that left too early because he ended up uh dying a, a, a couple years ago in a motorcycle accident that oh, marty man. and i didn't didn't know you know just like a good dude you know yeah uh but what are some of the things i learned there never leave a ranger behind never leave a ranger behind you know don't leave him behind and, and you know 
And that was even at home station, you know, because back when I was there, you know, I don't know what they look like now, but the Rangers were, you know, they were in there. We had the, uh, I'm pretty sure it was the green jungle fatigues, uh, but you, you, they also had the high and tight. So if somebody was stuck on the side of the road, you know, if you, know, if you a range better, if you like, if, if you were stuck on the side of the road, you're high and tight, and I drove past, that's a no go. Yeah, you know, yeah. you better, you better, better stop, help to help your buddy out. You know, they were very visible because not many people wore the high and tight, you know, yeah. that, you know, the fluff and buff, you know, what that is, is that if you had your field fatigues on, you had your PC, your patrol cap on, and if your starches, you know, that's when you had your bray on and, and stuff like that, you know, so they were very, very regimented, you know, uh, with that. So, but you could yeah. easily pick them out, you know, the, the train, train, train. It's like you had so many opportunities. Whether it's us as Air Force guys, or us as Air Force guys with the with the Rangers, you know, we're doing fast roping, repelling, f- fries, uh, shooting. You know, we didn't have shooting courses at the time, you know, mm-hmm. but we got to go do a bunch of a lot of good shooting, riding, getting qualified on motorcycles if you if you needed to, you know, flying on a little bird, you know, going to gun smokes, doing doing some of these things. It's like you know you learn these lessons that you can carry on to other, other, other organizations, which is something I'll talk about later, you know, about sharing your experiences, you know, that, that, that we need to do, we need to make sure that we do, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I got hearing protection is magical at the time, you know, I don't know what people were for hearing protection now, we didn't have very good hearing protection, which, hence my tinnitus, which probably a lot of people got anyway, no matter what, you know. Yeah. But you're doing these these gun smokes or something like that. You've got people shooting right next to you. And then we had this little, it was a little piece of rubber and a, and a little mic, you know. So you got one one air exposed, you know, you know. Yeah. And you got this thing. And it's, it's, it's not enough to, to stop anything, you know. And you got, you know, rounds coming, you know, shell casings coming over top of you, you know, if you're doing a gun smoke and people are shooting next to you and it's just like, Jesus Christ, you know, <laughs> just seriously, you know, yeah. eye openingly loud, you know, and I don't think, I think they came out with a sonic earplug, just a little thing, you know, that when we first got at some point when we got there, but, uh, I don't, you know, I, I just, yeah, I mean, it was you know. tough because you, like you said, we, when I first got there, it was the same thing you had, just that little piece, you know, you didn't really have any, like right now they will, the, they're those uh, Peltor headsets where they have the noise canceling and it's much safer. But yeah, I remember we used to, um, we used to uh, safety pin uh, earplugs to our sleeve and, you know, if, but, but at the time it, you, it wasn't like you could un, unsafety pin them real quick and stick them in your ears. I mean, it was like when you had to yeah. engage, it was like you had to engage. You didn't have time to mess around. So. Yeah. Oh, and I got the final call Gustav, you know, oh, magical nice. weapon. Yeah. Yeah. But again, enjoyed the hell out of being with the Rangers. You know, we had good people there. Oh, and then prior to my my leaving, this happened a few times where Marty comes in and I'm I'm leaving. So it happened here and it happened at the 14th. So I, I barely get any time working with Marty. And Marty and I are, are good friends. You know that. Mm. You know, have just missed working with each other many many times. But a lot of good dudes at at, at the Rangers. You know. Um, we did as best as we could with the capabilities and the tools that we had. You know, I know nowadays that with it being a SMU and all the stuff they got going on, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, they're having stacks of airplanes. We, we may have had an AC-130 and an airplane and maybe some helicopter, you know, mm-hmm. we had a baby stack, you know, we were like a, at the pancake house. I got the short stack and the current range has got the, got the full stack, you know, but anyway, <laughs> all good, you know, uh, but I go from, uh, Fort Benning to JCE, Joint Communications Unit, uh, Fort Bragg. So, so if you look at my career, I've been at Shaw for a year, Bragg for four, Benning for four, go back to Bragg. Um, so my, I haven't gone very far out of the right. tri-state area, you know. So I go, I go to JCE, and JCE, you know, the mission of JCE is to provide comms to so support a JSOC. And pretty good mission. Uh, you know, it's comm related, you know, uh, but they give you a lot of opportunities to, to train also, you know, and in fact, there's a, quite a few tech peeps up there. You know, I was there, Buddy McCarthy, Jimmy C. Brooks, Chet McClendon you know, coming out there. Eduardo Mialis, he was there at some point. And then before we got there, like 
Doug Tillman, Plunkett, uh, Randy Long, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I think why they wanted us is, you know, because we were tactically sound and we also were communication sound, you know. At the time, you know, right. we we didn't – we had a 104, 113. Uh, uh, we didn't have SATCOM at the TAC V squadrons yet. But when you went to JC and you know, your LST5, Bravo, Strong, you know, heavy and some other stuff, power amps and stuff like that. But single theory, single theory, you know. Uh, uh, but while I'm at JCU, uh, I get the opportunity. To, I'd gone to Halo School, I think, it, when I was, I, I went with it when I was at the Rangers. And I had the opportunity to go to, to Halo JM. Uh, I call it a gentleman's course. They came into an MTT mobile training team to, People on the on the hill got to go to. Oh, uh, cool. It's supposed to be a two week course. Yeah, it's supposed to be a two week course. I I successfully completed five days of it. Uh, failed the JMPI. Oh no, <laughs> JMPI. Yeah. So later on, uh, me and Eddie Eduardo Mialis went to Halo Jam down at Yuma. We were already good friends, but going there, the stressors of Halo Jam is not a hard course. It's it's just a jump master course, you know. They, you know, one, one thing they teach you about at Halo Jam, they, they teach you what is what right looks like. Mm-hmm. They never put a gig in there before you before you go to JMPI. They had they do JMPIs on people to make sure there's no gigs in there. So that way, when they when it comes time to doing the JMPI inspections, that if there is a gig, when they do put injected gig in there, you automatically see it because right doesn't look right, you know doesn't look right. right you know um so i was there i passed my jmpi and uh eddie eddie hadn't yet and so we, we i think he was talking about it. we messed with him a little bit that the instructors knew we were friends and you know <laughs> yeah he, he helped me he helped you know, one of the things we did was we, we would have a, prior to going to bed every night we'd have one one drink i think it was jack and coke or something like that just to so you could go to sleep and just Calm down, but yeah, Halo Jam with, with Eddie was, yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. Um, well, I was there also at, at JCU Operation Restored, what is it? Restored Democracy in Haiti kicks off. Uh, okay. I'm, uh, I'm supposed to go down and jump with the 82nd, 80 seconds all geared up, and I've got my rock, and I'm like, because I started linking up with the 14th again, too, at the time, because I got to link up who, who's going where, you know. Um, but we're supposed to be a liaison with with, with those guys because they're going to be in there. Uh, but I got this rock. It's stupid heavy because I got a I got a LST five Bravo KY amplifier, almost a case of batteries because you don't know how long it's going to be and stuff like right. that. Uh, so I thought I was going to get my second muster stain. End up not because as as we're heading over there, President Carter and and and, and some others, you know, diffuse the situation enough that. We ended up airland and done in, done in Haiti. And then we still supported the 82nd, you know, they were doing stuff, not, not, nothing combat related, but just, I think, securing patrol type stuff. I just, um, but what, what was weird about the 82nd, that I guess it's not the 82nd, the, the location we stayed in, they ended up putting these, they found these big hangar bays, whatever in there. So they put the talks inside them and, you know, and they had all the air conditioners running inside there. So, you know, the, the big East environmental control units, it's huge boxes. Mm-hmm. And that's the same place we were sleeping. So I remember seeing Buddy MacArthur because he ended up going on this trip with me too, just laying in a pool of sweat because it's, you know, Hades, you know, and, you know, it's a hundred degrees. They got air conditioners blowing to this building with the, the exhaust being right by your, your sleeping area. And oh it's just like, gosh. so crazy, you know, but, but <laughs> Haiti, you know, nothing, not much happened on, on Haiti. Uh, but I did get to go back on the USS America for five days. And, and I, Randy Long was on there previously, and I think he met up with some people. Uh, but I didn't know Roger was on there until, you know, I think on your podcast. You, you, didn't, you didn't know I was actually on there because I just used it as a way to get back. You know, oh, he, no kidding. He spent, yeah. <laughs> I think he spent like two or three weeks there, you know, on the, the America, you know. Yeah. Um, but I just did the drive back. But one of the other things we would do, we would put comms on ships. We would put comms everywhere. Um, uh, you know, yeah. but what do I remember at JCU? Uh, 
he who sets up the antenna probably has a weakness. Uh, and why do I say that? Because one of the things that, you know, people that gravitate to the easy, mm. uh, probably have, have a weakness because the antenna was always the easiest thing to set up. So you, you may have this uh, pallet comm system you got to set up. You got to do all these other, other tasks, mm-hmm. and, you know, that may be difficult, but if, if, if I see, I always, always go to the antennas. I go, he doesn't know something. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that was you know, easy you, thing. You can just, they, yeah, it's easy. He doesn't know how to do the compound or he's afraid of the compound. He doesn't trust himself on the compound, you know? So okay. now, Got to refocus to see what the what 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 the weakness is, you know, to to, to get them there. Mm. And then, uh, as with the Rangers crew deals, you know, train like a fight, simulate, you know, uh, continue like that. And one of the things I see is I had this guy named Steve Zachman. He was a Marine, and you know, when he was doing this, what we called this J one package, it was at X time he had to take off, was, you know, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But he would take a, a, a timer, click the timer. If he had, let's say, he had X, X amount of time to do it, he'd click the timer, go to the safe, spin the safe open, get, get the ComSec out, go to the go to the vehicle, turn everything on, do all his radio checks, click it, you go. Did I make time? You know, so you know, he, he you know, slow, smooth, smooth as fast, and he practiced that, you know, by by doing those drills that you know. He wasn't the guy that was setting up the antenna, you know. Right, right. He was able to, he was able to do what he, what he was doing. Nice. But uh, uh, a lot of good good people there, Army guys, Chris Gonzalez, Gonzalez, which Gonzo, him and Eddie are, are tight. And this guy named Sull- Sull- Sullivan uh, helped me out you know, while I was there. Uh, I don't know if I was a team leader the whole time, but I became a Thatcher chief at, at some point for a few years, oh. which which was good working with a bunch of joint joint force people, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, I make E eight while, while I'm at JCU in ninety three, and my time was up, so I'm looking for a place to go. And fourteenth's right out right outside the door, you know. Yeah. So luckily, I got to go back. Nice. So I go back to 14th ASOS and I got people like Timmy Pachesa, Super Dave Pickle, Pete Klein, which I, I owe a lot to, Mike Brzezinski, Matt Schleich, Ivan Ruiz is there at some point, Robert Jeez. Zach, Chris, Chris, Chris Jenner, Todd Gannon, oh, Israel, man. JJ, Roger, Nate Holton, Scott Stanley, you know, to name a few. I mean, it's just a plethora of dudes, you know. And, yeah, that's and, a great know, crew. When you, you think about the the attitude, the motivation, the the people. I I couldn't I couldn't couldn't be happier, you know. Yeah. Um, because they would push you, sometimes you know, <laughs> positively, and sometimes you know, a little harshly. But it was all, it was all good, you know. But, you know, through the years, you know, I learned a lot about training. So one of the things we we tried to do, you know, at, at the fourteenth was provide realistic training to the, to the guys, you know, so we would conduct, uh, numerous emergency readiness deployment exercises where we had the pages, we would either have them go off, you know, like w- one of the things we tried to do is, you know, when they least suspected, you know, it's Friday night, you know, it's like, we have them to go off on Friday night or whatever. Yeah. Um, but these, these, these exercises helped, helped us become, uh, I would say stronger operators. You know, like one of the times, uh, one of the exercises I remember, it was, it was pretty fun. was, you know, at Ranger School, you, you learn how to, you get a, this ammo can and they have you cooking it. You take the rubber gasket seal out, you put potatoes, rice, or whatever. And I think you, you get goat or something to eat and you cook it, you know, you're eating it. So what we tried to do with, with us is we had a, a, a deployment. Uh, we did a jump. My wife had gone to, I don't know what, where she got them, but, you know, got some like five or six fluffy little rabbits along, you know, little pretty ones with the long ears and got, got from me. And we ended up jumping in, setting up a bit of bivouac site. Al Sullivan, yeah. uh, taught Dakota trench fire. And I think he taught how to clean, clean and kill the, the rabbits. People that had gone to Sears World already yeah. knew, but not everybody had gone to Sears because our pipeline at the time was, you know, from tech school to a unit. Maybe going to 
airborne on the way, but it was, there was just, there was no pr pipeline. So most people got seer school after. So he taught how to, how to kill the, kill and skin the rabbit and have it, the, the smoke was fire. And, um, so after we, you know, we have dinner and stuff like that, we're going to go on a, a movement to contact or an ambush or something. Uh, but while we're doing the movement, you know, we had pre, pre states and CS gas. And so we ended up, uh, popping CS gas and, and stuff like that. And there's this guy named Jim Ray at TC, he's no longer in, but he, he maintains contact with a lot of the, the 14th guys, which is kind of cool. But anyway, he's, he couldn't get his protective mask on soon enough. And he's just gagging and coughing and doing all this snot, you know, whatever, you know, yeah. and he sees, he tells us, he sees us. And it's like, we're like, there's a moonlit background. Me and Roger are walking in. And it's like, we're just walking through and he's like, God, these guys are gods and it's not affecting them. But, we were upwind of it. So All right. you know, his vision, I thought, thought we were, you know, you know, just hard, hard asses. We, we just, we just didn't run into it. All right. Right. But that was pretty funny. But, you know, so we tried to do realistic stuff, you know, uh, and then when we came back, you know, uh, more than one occasion, you know, we'd use real time sack or real half click stuff, you know, guys had gone home myself or myself and another person would, would walk around, put, put the handset on the, the, the K-57, turn it on, nothing, okay, good. Turn it on, nothing, good. Uh-oh, they didn't clear the comm sec. Recall them back. Uh, they weren't always too happy about that. But uh, the thing that we did too, it's like support wasn't immune to being part of these injuries too. Because, you know, uh, when I was at the Rangers, uh, noticed that on a helicopter more than one occasion they were doing ivs on their nods which is i thought it was freaking amazing you know yeah. so we tried we tried to have a, a support guy give iv on the red lens and then we also had him doing cpr in a in a, in a moving vehicle simulated cpr on a dude in a moving vehicle so that way they could do, you could do that you know but um one of the things that i wish i could have been there for because we planned this one exercise probably took six to nine months to plan it was operation, ended up being called Operation Christmas time because it took so long. I wanted the guys, I went to the SEER school instructors, talked to them. I said, hey, man, every time people go to SEER school, they go to these schools, they come in sanitized, you know. So what I want to have happen is our guys, I want our guys to jump in. We'll give them ComSec, you know, all this intel data and let's set, see what they have, you know. I want you guys to snatch them, you know. So we did multiple times you know trying to figure out when we could do it and then and, you know so they came up with a date uh where i couldn't be and i'll talk about that later but uh so when we figure out the date they wanted to make sure that people were trained or refreshed on on serious school stuff because because sure. if they didn't remember it there's no learning objective so they they came in taught a class we kept a record of who actually was in the class so that way they could attend the the seer the seer portion of we had them jump in. They got all this dirtiness on them. Right. They're supposed to do a partisan link up at a, bu at a bus, and then they're sitting on the bus. The SEER guys basically capture them. They're asking, who are you, this, that, and other, you know, just being all tight-lipped, you know. But it says 14th ASOS on their T-shirts, you know, so, you know, it's kind of like a freebie they could give away. Okay. Uh, but they sent them, they sent them to a res resistance training lab. They did what they do at the lab. Mm -hmm. But was, what was funny is that, Super Dave Bickle had a dentist appointment, but he had gone to the training. So Master and Harrison had, after he came back from his appointment, drove him out to the Sear School, made sure that he got in there, got got, got, it, got his love. But yeah, but again, you know, the, the, the whole intent was that it's, it, it's to see how these guys react to realistically, you know, if you go somewhere, you're not going to be sterilized, you know. Most, right. you, you, you try to sterilize as best you can, but these guys, you know, had to, had to work around what, what they had. And all I can hope is, you know, cause this is, you know, 97 to 2000, you know, that the, the work that we put in at, at, at the 14th as, as a leadership team, you know, um, we hope that that helped prepare the guys for nine 11, you know, by having all this realistic training, you know? Oh, I, I'm sure there's no question. And they'll probably, I don't know. I can't speak for them, but I'm sure that prepared them exponentially for combat. Yeah. Now this is where I'm probably going to take some flack from some 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 special ops people. Okay. <laughs> and maybe you, maybe maybe not, you know. Uh, uh, but one of my pet peeves, and I can't, pet peeve is too hard. Special operators, people that get in a soft community, 
once they, they need to do one or two stints there and then get out. Why I say that? Because just the other day you had paint nipple on, and, you know, Chief Lundquist had done some, done the Ranger thing and stuff like that, got out, went to the tech school. And if it wasn't for Chief Lundquist, you know, having that Ranger stink on him, understanding the, the, the soft mission, and if he had never, not, hadn't got it out, paint nipple might not have gotten in, you know, sure. because it, it, it was it was like, here's a square guy, guy, he believes in me, I can I can go do it, you know. Yeah. The thing I looked at the, at the soft guys is it's like I used to say uh, when they, when they leave the, at the time the twenty second or whatever, you know, go to Korea. Korea is not a good example of leaving because. People's mindsets aren't aren't the same, but if they go, hey, where do, you know, hey, JD Welsh, he squared away. Where do you get where do you get this? You know, and you go, well, you can say, hey, I got this at the Rangers, this and the other. You know, you spread so much capability and knowledge that you can't grow the next soft force if you don't spread up, spread have this people go out. You know, mm -hmm. but they don't have to go out for forever. You know, they can come back in. You know, I just think that. Uh, there's so many great people that are there that, that don't want to leave. And I, I understand why, but yeah. to grow the next generation, you, you know, it, it helps to go, to go. Sure. Uh, what are some of the fond memories I have of the, of, of the 14 getting rolled? What a place, you know, <laughs> yeah. I found my, uh, you know, besides getting rolled, I found my office outside in my parking lot, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it got, <laughs> Uh, more than one time, you know, I got rolled, but one of the times that I got rolled is I was supposed to be working this volant rodeo escort for this two-star general. Mm -hmm. I had to be in early that morning and I don't know what was with the guys, but they decided to say, today's the day again, Sergeant V is getting rolled. And so they, I'm in, sitting in my office, all fat, dumb and happy. Next thing I'm, I'm, I'm on the floor, I'm, I'm fighting, kicking, scratching, whatever, doing whatever I can. And my head has just got carpet burns all through it, like, right, you know, uh, you know all, all of it. So that's like at seven, at eight o'clock, I got to pick up this two star general and take him to his building and stuff like that. And so he looks at me and he goes, like, What happened to you? You know, I said, I said my, my fellows decided to roll me today, you know, you know, show me some love, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the thing about getting rolled is you never got rolled if you weren't loved, you know. Right. You sure. know, it, it, they try to, to roll the people that sometimes, you know, can be a game. It can be fun, you know, but they try to make you, there, there's a reason. Yeah. Um, another fun thing I remember, every, not every Friday, some Fridays you used to have a keg of beer at the 14th, you know, and we, we ended up calling it diamond for dollars. You know, when the keg ran out, you know, <laughs> what, what's it to do? Well, let's throw a 20 in the, the ice container to, to fit the big <laughs> drum. And you'd pay a dollar, and then what people would do is they're like they'd grab you and hold you over the the beer container. You got a pair of swim goggles, and you're, you're using your mouth to try to grab the twenty. And then the only way you can get out is because you, your your hands are on your side. And you have to tap your oh, side, right. you know. So tap tap out to get out, tap out to get out, you know. But it was, it was pretty pretty fun, you know. If you got the twenty, you got the you got the the whole thing, you know. Nice. The, the whole. Uh, another thing I remember. Colonel Parent was a squadron commander at the time. He said, hey, man, recall, recall roster is your designated driver roster. You know, if you get called, you go, you know, pick them up. And so one day I was – actually, it's not one day. On Christmas Eve, the wife and I are sleeping. Get this call. Pick up the phone and it's like, hey, sir, me. It's Chris. And it was like, Chris and uh, – Mitch Kelly and somebody else. We're at the bottoms up. Come pick us up. I'm like, Are you? I didn't know the strip club was open. You know, on, on yeah, Christmas, Christmas Eve. Eve yeah. I said, I'll, I'll come pick you up, but you get better be there. And he's like, Yeah, because they all they're like, hey, Who can we call? Uh, sorry, yeah, let's just get him. You know. Yeah. So I go pick him up. You know, drop him off right before you know. Mitch Kelly tries to give me a, a kiss on the cheek or something like that. You know, a dip in his mouth and stuff like that. But. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, again, we try to make sure everybody's safe. And, uh, one of the things that I got enjoyment out of is watching people that you've trained pass on the lessons that you've given them, you know, because you, you know, it's like 
the, the growth that they have. And I remember sitting in the office one day, I'm like watching John Lowry. He's, 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 he's on the Humvee with a map and with, a, with an airman just going over things. And you just know he's doing the, doing the right thing. And it's just like, as a senior NCO, that's where you get your, your smiles from, you know? Right. Um, and I was very, very, that, that time just, just always clicked. And then, uh, paper, plastic. What a, what a, I don't know where this came from, but it, 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 I'll give you the story. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, some airmen invited me to go to a racetrack and watch these car races, you know, the cars with the little fins on the, the different size fins on, on, on the yeah. side. So we go to this racetrack and it's on a Friday or whatever. It could have been a Saturday. Probably it was a Saturday. Not that that matters, but I think my wife and my daughter, uh, were there watching the race. Guys are drinking. Then I see this kid start drinking. I'm like, Axel, are you 21 yet? He goes, Sarmpy, no. Then I go, you can't drink. Right. And then, uh, so I, I told my wife before I talked to him, I said, I hate this because now I got to be the bad guy. You know, you're supposed to have a good time, you know, all this stuff, you know, but, you know, I can't condone underage drinking, you know, you know, sure. when, I, when I'm there. Right. Uh, so at some point, you know, in my life, I'd watched a Die Hard, and I think, I think it was a Die Hard movie, but there was plastic laid out on the, on the floor, and they, end up shooting this guy and the plastic was just save, you know, not, not dirty the floor. But so I ended up taking a big tarp and put it in the office on Monday morning. And it's got regular size push up prints, diamond push up prints, you know, <laughs> fingerprints on there. About this. <laughs> yeah. So I bring the guys upstairs that were, that were at the racetrack and I said, drop. So they come in there and I'm talking to them. I said, Hey, uh, yada, 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 you know, we can choose paper, you know, LLC, this, whatever, you know, or plastic, it's a little sweat equity. And then uh, we can stop at any time if you think it's harassment, this, that, and the other. And so I just, we, I can't say I, providing them some mentorship moments. You know, I think Roger Cross even, even helped out a little bit, you know, with the, with the discussion, you know, of the, the chatting. But, I mean, they were just smoked. I mean, and then it permeated down to, to the, the rest of the squad and that, you know, they're up there. Because we, although we had an air-conditioned building, we didn't have air conditioning in our office. It just yeah. trickled. So they're just sweating, you know. So, but that's why I came up with paper or plastic, you know. Um, and, I, and I've talked about it before with, with other organizations, you know, other places that I've been that, you know, yeah, I mean, if you can not damage somebody, but let them realize that the error in their way or whatever, you know, plastic is better than paper if you, if you, if you, if you can give it to them. Uh, person I wanted to highlight too, two people, Monica Calder Schleck. You know, she came in, I know, I assume you know Monica. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. She comes to the squadron, you know, she's a admin girl. I don't think she was, she came airborne qualified. I think she went to airborne school after she got there. But I found an article in the Amber Magazine. I thought she was the first girl, but in 1999, they had an article on her in the Amber Magazine. Well, she's at the 14th, but she's she said the second. I was going to say the first, but I, she was the second. She's the first in my mind. Uh, but what a badass. I mean, she, you know, not only did she marry Match like, you know, at some point in her career, well, they're a brag, but, you know, she goes to the airborne school. She hangs with a guy. She does the PT. She later on comes a black hat. She does all this, you know, she's kind of like a trailblazer that was at the 14th that, you know, I don't know where she got it, but you know, then she got like a CrossFit gym and stuff like that. But she's she's awesome. Yeah, quite an amazing person. And then I want to talk about a support guy because you know a lot of times you get first sergeants in in, in squadrons, and they're so first sergeant. You know, it's like, hey, so this is what you know. You do this. This is what what, what the recommended you know punishment is. This you know all this stuff. Oh. We had this guy, named Scotty Jackson, who was not a diamond wearer, but he was a radio maintenance support superintendent. He'd done a couple of tours of this. The 14th was his first unit. Uh, but he helped the guys, you know, you know, helped them with a lot of stuff. And, you know, I just want to make sure that when we talk about great tag P's, we also talk about other great support people and he was one of them i mean from helping them out to do you know from making sure that they didn't get in trouble or coming up with other ways or minimizing the damage that you know that, that, that the kids had done and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that but that poor son of a bitch 
they really loved him because yeah. he got world more than I did, oh, I you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it was like it got to the point that when I when I left, he was like, "Dude, I'm, I'm getting my ass kicked." We ended up going to the hood later on too, but doing more great things. But um, wanted to make sure I talked to him about that. Oh, right before I left uh, for Bragg, I get orders. Hey, you know, I get noticed that Marty's coming down. But before I give him on the games roster, I think he even said this too. I, I, I somehow get him on the loss roster. So right, I think right. Marty and I may may have had a day or two together before he came down from the hill. Um, um, but what a great dude, you know? Yeah, yeah, the best. But so I go from Bragg to Hawaii. I get to Hawaii as an E8 in 2000. And while, while I'm there, Eric Kibbe is there, Matt Schleich is there, again, Matt Nugent, and, you know, and Jason Wall, Ken Lindsay, more home run hitters than, than I can shake a stick at again, yeah. you know, so. Awesome guys. Um, guys that have done really well. One of the things that ends up happening to me, that's when 9-11 kicks off, you know, while I'm, while I'm in Hawaii. The day that, not, on the actual 9-11, I was on my way to get shoulder surgery. I think it was my, my third shoulder surgery at the time, second or third. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the towers and everything not happening. So, uh, didn't go. Um, but I was there for slightly less than two years, a little disappointed. Again, when you, when you, when you talk about light units, I mean, 25th isn't much different than the, the 14th. They got a, yeah. it's a light fighter unit, light, light, light minded people, you know, so they go to aerosol school, they, you know, they, they, they know how to train, you know, uh, so I get there, we continue the, the training regime, you know, trying to make sure that people are smart away and stuff like that. Um, but while well, I was there, I make chief, uh, and there was already a chief there. So even though I, I got there in 2000, the chief on island had been there for six years and there was only one billet. Okay. Uh, he was the earlier, Steros has some leave. And so he had previously extended. So oh, okay. he had a year. So it, it ended up making me depart island you know at the two-year point a little disappointing it ended up ended up going to fort hood from 2000 2002 as a as my first chief assignment and one of the things that you know i learned as a chief you know when you're working with air force people or, or and stuff like that chiefs get shit done and i don't know why it, 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 just because it's a chief and then you know i don't know why they won't support you as an e8 you know but you know the air force will support an e9 you know so what i tried to do uh, when i was at fort Camp for the hood is trying to bring all the seniors, you know, senior shows together. So if an E7, E8, or E9, you know, there was no E7 or E8 or me, uh, ask you to do something, we want you to do it versus just the chief, you know, it's, it's disheartening that if you're a senior NCO, you shouldn't be able to get, you should get the same support as an E9 gets, you know, uh, but for sure, it doesn't work that way sometimes, but yeah. uh, so I was at, Fort Hood for a couple of years, not a bad assignment. Then I go from Fort Hood to Germany to the TACP functional manager. That was a little different. You know, it's actually kind of nice because I got to work close to the TACPs. We got to work their funding. We got to work their deployments. You know, the last part of a couple of years of the new safety functional job was trying to return forces to, to you know, from Europe to, to the Conos as they were trying to downsize, you know, the oh, Europe okay. squadrons and stuff like that. I do a few years there. Not a bad assignment. You learn a lot, you know, you learn some money stuff. You learn, you know, how the processes work. Then I go to Fort Stewart from 2007 to 2009. Uh, while I was there, the third ID deploys and the 15th day South was with it. And, uh, one of the things I remember on this deployment was a couple of things I remember on this deployment. Oh, uh, there's a senior, I think he was a senior airman, TJ Gundell. Yeah. I just, I, you know, TJ was there. Uh, and he was a young guy, you know, but I, I remember one time walking in the top. To me, he seemed very motivated, seemed like a square away dude, you know, but, but For sure. I remember him standing up one day, something happened. He goes, attention to the talk, attention to the talk, you know, just commanding a voice, you know, not afraid to do it. I don't know what happened, but very square away guy. You, know, you, you kind of follow people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he's one of the ones that have followed. He's, he's, he's done really well for himself. But so we're there for, six a little bit over six months and i guess you could call it the two funnies that i had was there is mr bubble guts uh what i mean by that is i went down i was in the, the the talk and somebody was not feeling well not feeling well at all and so 
what ended up happening is I, I go to the bathroom, I look to my right, and there's a there's a, a, a toilet stall. And somebody must have been, when they were taking down their pants, came like this, and it was a like a 270-degree spray oh against God. the back wall on oh. the toilet, everywhere, you know. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know. And the guy left, left it there. So I go back down to the office, and I, I grab some airmen. I say, hey, man. Go check out stall one. Bring a wingman too, you know. So they go in. It's just like just just trash bathroom, you know. Oh. But it ended up being some sergeant major ended up cleaning it up, which was surprising. You know, he was in there like working on, you know, because he figured he'd put some task. Unless that was a good dude that did it, you know. Right, uh, right, right. Uh, uh, then another kind of funny things that ha that happened during that that trip was during the battle update brief there's a captain or lieutenant that gave the weather brief and he said well, yeah yada yada and possible snow dead silence on the bomb <laughs> this is in baghdad you know talking about snow in baghdad yeah. it hadn't snowed in over 80 years and, he, and, the, and the division commander goes did you say snow <laughs> and it's like yeah next day snow no it, was, it was probably about yeah it, it was probably yeah I thought it was 2006, but I had to s search it up because I, I want to make sure I was right what the year was. It was yeah. 2008, and it had been over 80, I think over 80 years since it snowed in Baghdad. It's since it snowed again, but yeah. um, but it was just wild. And it was a, it was a decent Crazy. amount of snow that was in there. Yeah, it, it snows elsewhere, just not in Baghdad. Uh, so then while, while I'm there, uh, oh, at some point during all these, these festivities, uh, General Angoria became the commander of the 44th during all the 44th AEW during all this mm -hmm. deployment stuff. And he had asked me to be his acting command chief. And I'm like, okay, you know, you know, I never thought about being a command chief or an acting command chief, but I don't know why he picked me, but anyway, he did. So he gave me the first thing as an acting command chief. But while I was at that acting command chief, I remember going somewhere and I saw Sean O'Neill and I, you know, he was doing night missions and all this stuff, you know, and I was also talking to other airmen. And, I, and the thing that I got from the other airmen, it's like, you know, we say tip of the spear, you know, Sean may have been the tip of the spear, but you can't be productive if you don't have the staff or, you know, and sure. what I mean by that, the, there was, there was, I, I talked to the, the guys that had the big generators and keeping the generators running and stuff like that. And the guys that are keeping the ECUs running, you know, Sean O'Neill got to do his stuff effectively because others were, providing the power, the AC, the food, so that way he can do his mission at night because he got sleep, he got food and, and, and stuff like that. So definitely a little yeah. different perspective I got, you know, but also while I was at, on this trip to Camp Victor with the 15th ASOS, General Angoria asked me to be the, his command chief at, because he was getting like the 93rd AGO. Like, right, right. You know, I said, hey, can I call you back tomorrow? You know, <laughs> you know, because, yeah, you know, I didn't know, you know, yeah, and again, Marty had gone to command chief, you know, he's pretty dynamic. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dynamic like that, you know? So it was a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I, I ended up saying yes, you know, uh, but, uh, I do that for a couple of years, maybe, maybe actually maybe just a year. And then, uh, I got asked if I wanted to be the absent command chief, which, um, General Hostage was the, the three star at the time, interviewed me. Um, so I ended up being the absent command chief from 2010 to 2011, which, which, which is a pretty good gig, you know. Yeah. Yes, it's with the, the Air Force, but you know, the thing that you're trying to do as a command chief is, you know, make things easier, make things better, you know. Uh, sometimes enforcer, uh, trying to get internet for all the farms, you know, trying to, help 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 those little nugget pieces and stuff like that so i did that uh but i don't know what he's generally guy saw in me to to do the command chief thing but well i mean i think you saw what we all see i mean you you're you're st stellar dude i mean it doesn't surprise me a bit that he would ask you to do that for sure it makes perfect okay. sense to me well as as the dude i know, you know. It's because you're you're like you're like everybody. You're like Jazz. You're like Marty. You're like Kenny. Every, real humble. You know, you do your job. You do it well. You crush. Uh, but you don't. You know, you don't seek that recognition. You don't. You don't toot your own horn. And um, people see that. And I uh, I could totally see how you know you and guys like I just mentioned would 
be in those positions. You know, people see that and well deserved. And, and like I said, that doesn't surprise me a bit that he would ask you. Oh, well, cool. Yeah. So I do, I do the year there, go see a lot of people, do a lot of different things. Uh, but I did spend maybe seven days, ten days. I don't remember how many days with the combat truckers, and I chose to do that because they're not getting it. They weren't getting any love, and so I, I went to started in Kuwait, learned how to drive a, a tractor, you know, all this stuff, and mm-hmm. then they ended up having me drive the support vehicle, which has got it, you know, the, the tow the tow thing, and then and so we drive from somewhere in, in Kuwait to I think to Baghdad. I don't think we. I don't know if we drove other places. I don't remember. While you're out there, there's some places you knew with the high chances, that you, high probability you, know, you can get engaged. It's kind of like ducks on the pond. It's like, you know, like, hey, we're going to this hot area. And it's just like, just barreling through, you know. But yeah. what was hard for those guys is that, you know, a part or, or a piece of the puzzle you don't see is that they, they go somewhere, they go to a fob, you know, as a jumping point to, to their end point. They get there, they'd have to fight for ability, you know, or tent space and have to fight for food, you know, and just constantly you know, getting treated, you know, as really third or fourth class citizens, you know, yeah. and they're just trying to do their job, you know, so everywhere you right. went, it's like always a battle, you know, it's like, good God. Yeah. But so hats off to those guys that always going, you know, driving without, you know, because there's, there's no, it wasn't like there was a bunch of gun chiefs, you know, going with you and stuff like that, you know, yeah. it's just like ducks in a pond. It's like, it's your, you know, you don't know. If it's your lucky day that, or your unlucky day that day, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Super underappreciated. Yeah. So I go from Afghanistan to the nineteenth, uh, which is kind of different because you get used to working with a three star, and then you go back to working with a lieutenant colonel and squadron ops and stuff like that. You know. Right. Different, but you know, I, I had to do. I, I did a year there. Uh, still a bunch of great guys there. You know. But while I was there, I uh, was filling out my first job application, you know, trying to figure out what was going on. I'm on my back deck at Fort Campbell, and all of a sudden I get a text from or text from Pete Klein. He goes, hey, I got a great job, you know, in Virginia, D.C. area, yada, yada. Uh, so he ends up hooking me up with a job with Booz Allen and, and had a, did a 10-year stint in Virginia, working with great people, you know, Mike Bozinski, Pete Klein and some others and, and, and people from others other, other walks of life, but did that for 10 years and then it stinks, it stinks for him. And then I moved to Hawaii for the last year and uh, in, a, in a few few days, actually next Friday, I'm actually going full full retired, you know, 15, 15 December, you know, I'm 60 years old, go full retired, uh, spend time with the, the wife and stuff. But, before I finish today, you know, I wanted to say some thanks to the people, you know, for the, I want to say thanks to the, the special ops community, 17th ASOS crews, you know, the guys that were in it before it was the 17th and, and stuff like that, like you, Eric, Sly, Q, Tommy. It, it has taken the stuff that Jazz and I initially were in, it's, it, it's gone leaps, leaps and bounds. I wanted to especially thank General Angoria because he was a noodle pusher. You know, he, he moved the football forward, you know. I don't know how he got into our community, you know. You know, right time, did he do something wrong, you know. But you think about it, right before 9-11, he, you know, he, he was a group commander. That, I mean, when you, when you talk to people, you know, they have said, hey, Longoria said, go over here. Longoria said, go over here, you know. Longoria said, you know, go over here. Support support the, the warfighters coming back, you know. Um, I don't know if that would have happened without him, you know, but. He, he pushed us forward, you know, uh, a great deal. And again, before he was there, people like the Lieutenant Colonels weren't getting promoted. You know, he got like Shaq Bouchain, Donnelly, Gentilly, Violet, you know, and those are just some of the, the few that got, you know, promoted to 06, you know. Uh, right. Not that he got them promoted. He got them into the, t- the fold and they, they got themselves promoted, but great bunch of officers. He picked a great team. He, he, he was always a visionary and he, he did piss people off at times, but I mean, that's because he, you know, made people uncomfortable, you know, right. And sometimes you got to be uncomfortable. And then like uh, Colonel Hodges, he was a 14th ALO, 18th ASOG ALO. Uh, but he, you know, he's got a tattoo, tattoo, I think, you know, but he, he spent a lot of time with us, you know, trying to push the noodle forward. Yeah. Uh, some others, Marty Klukas, you know, again, like I said, special thanks goes out to him because, you know, we met him as airmen in Alaska. Never really got to work together, but we we followed each other. We challenged each other. We supported each other. 
Roger Cross is another special thanks, you know, because I got to work with him at mostly at the 14th and he was the yin to my yang. We all have gaps and he was always plugging in my, my shortfalls and which was very good. And I'd like to say Doug Tillman too, because what he did is he pushed the noodle forward in, in different ways. Like he was one of the founding guys, you know, got us into JCU. You know, yeah. I, I, he may have been the first guy to go to the Halo school to get us slots in, in there, you know, so he made some new opportunities. And then people like Tim Pachesa, Mike Brzezinski, Robert Zachary, and Steve Zachman, because uh, I'm not the best at it, but they always reach out. They're always contacting me. They're always saying, hey, hey, brother, how you doing? You know, how's your day? You know, and stuff like that. So having people that will make that contact, you know, is, is always really nice. And the fact, Steve Zachman, my Marine buddy, sends me a, an email every year on, you know, hey, it's Marine's birthday, this, that, and the other. Well, he didn't this year. And I send him a text. Doesn't reply. You know, it's like, oh, my God, you know, like, you know, what's up, you know? You know, he was, he was hunting, you know, but it's oh. just like, you know, uh, we missed a contact, you know, missed contact, you know, you know, sure. so got me, got me a little worried at first, you know, but great dude. And so, uh, wanted to thank him. And then PD, PD Klein for giving me the booze. I mean, I can't say enough about booze. I can't say enough about the job that I was able to afford an opportunity, opportunity to do while I was in Virginia. The association, you know, for letting us link up together down in create having these these venues where we can rehash we, you know link up with each other and it's nice and then i'd be remiss if i didn't say my family because when you think about how i got to do these things my wife comes in number one because she took care of the kids you know she made sure that they were fed and i'm gone uh, she, when they like when i came back but she you know make sure there's food in the fridge because it's like one of the things we do is like when we come back from a deployment or something like that, you open the fridge and there's nothing in it. It's like, well, how did you survive? You know, whether she had food in the fridge most of the time when I was gone, but she had it when I was, when I was home. But it's, it's like they survived without you for six months or, you know, all these, all these times, you know, but if it wasn't for the spouse, for all our spouses, you know, to, right. to give us opportunity, to afford us the opportunity to, to do these, these things. I don't know where it would be. And if you don't mind, I'd like to pass on, you know, since this is my, my finny flight, if you want to call it, well, maybe, uh, I don't think this opportunity is going to happen again, but, uh, pass a few nuggets or nuggets of goodness. I like to call things some of the things that I've learned you know, through the years. And one is like a decision not made is still a decision made. So people sometimes flounder on making a decision. When you don't make a decision, you, you've made a decision not to make a decision, which is probably worse. You know, go for the 80% solution, do something, you know, um, uh, and then great mentors are imprinting invisible fingerprints from those they mentor to whom they mentor. And what I mean by that is like, when you provide mentorship to somebody, say it's me, that mentorship that you provided me, I'm passing on to somebody else in a way that's affecting the, the, the next generation. Uh, and I see this too often now, people aren't present. You know, be present when talking to folks. Stop what you're doing, listen, give them eye contact, give me a full attention. And I realize that, you know, sometimes, you know, even like, if you want to connect with somebody when they're shaking their hand, you look them in the eye. It makes a big difference. Be an obstacle remover, not an obstacle in place. Or so many people try to look for why you can't do something versus how you can. You look for the, the avenues. And I thought about this one the other day. The things you say or do may be trivial to you, but not to others. Maybe monumental. And then again, I go back to I watched Paint Nipples uh, video the other day. And, you know, it's like he was talking about he had failed at land now this that and the other and eric kibbe just gave him the soft gentle you can do it which made him feel that he could do it uh may have meant nothing to eric or it may have just been a gentle positive feedback but it made a difference with with Peyton yeah because he, he like he remembers that that event yeah. yeah adversity introduces one to themselves uh most people well, face adversity in their life. And what I mean by it introduces you to yourself is it's like, how do you take that action? You know, what do you, where, where do you go from there? You know, now that you, you have this, this adversity, what are you going to grow? Are you going to sit back, you know, you're going to blame others, you know? So I like the remove the I, insert the we. Uh, I try not to say I, when, I, when we're doing things, successes are the, they, they succeeded. I failed. Right. Uh, and, too many people say, you know, I did this, I did this, I'm going to take an ex you know, exceptions to, but it's not really the I. It, it was, the, he was part of the team. 
And uh, I guess one of the last things I want to say, don't be afraid to say, love your brother. Yeah. You know, first the word love, say it to your friends, you know, say, love your brother. Let them know you love them, you know. Um, and then I just want to say thanks to you for affording me this opportunity. I was a little worried about it because I'm pretty introverted. I don't like Facebook, you know. If, if you see me on Facebook, I'll put thanks to other people, but I don't post a lot. I'll do messages, you know, but uh, I, I appreciate what you're doing. You're making a difference. I don't know what your drive is, but I appreciate your drive for doing it, you know, to capture these less lessons and it makes a difference. It may be uncomfortable, but you know, it's, it's all good. I appreciate what, you, what you're doing. Um, yep. And you're a good, great dude, you know, so I appreciate keep it. up, keep up what you're doing, keep up people in the un uncomfortable zone. You know, if they're like me, you know, uh, tell them they can do it, but thank you. Yeah. The pleasure is all mine. And I, I like I said, uh, I can't thank you enough for doing that. I, you, You've summed it up perfectly, and I really don't have too much to add. So, again, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Shady. Hey!